These words from the Apostle Paul. From the fifth chapter of Romans. While we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though perhaps for a good person, someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we still were sinners, Christ died for us. Much more surely then, now that we have been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more surely having been reconciled, we will be saved by his life. But more than that, we even boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now, we have now received reconciliation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I don't talk much about hell. Do I? <laughs> no. Can't, can't remember the last time I preached a sermon in which hell made any kind of appearance. <clears throat> and that's on purpose because I know something about hell. Um... There's nobody in hell except the people who desire to be there. I know that sounds silly, but there are people who dislike God so much, who reject God so severely that uh, they don't move into the presence of God when they leave this world. And everybody has to go somewhere because life is eternal. And therefore, God has graciously provided a place for people to go who don't want to be with him, as strange as that may seem. But you know the people who are angry, the people who are intent on hurting others. There is no evil in hell except that which people bring with them. There is no fire in hell except that which people exact against one another. And the door to hell is always open for anyone who remembers the name to call on or who seeks to love, or who is willing to receive God's love. The reason I'm talking about this is we had a member of this church who a number of years ago had an experience of hell. Name was Jerry. Um, Jerry, had, was, Jerry was diabetic, and uh, he was in the hospital, and he had a, he had a foot amputated, okay? Jerry had always been a little bit angry. What I believe happened is, I think he probably left his family and uh, went off with somebody else. There's somebody else was also a member of the church, and we love both of them, okay? So these are people that we loved. But he left his family, and he was estranged from all of his children. And Jerry was always a little bit angry, very, very critical. You won't believe this. He was, all, he was sometimes even critical of the preacher. No, you wouldn't believe that. Yeah, yeah no, no, what could it be? Hmm. Well, Jerry was in the hospital and I had visited him, but I hadn't gotten back there the, 
day after his surgery yet. And I remember it was a Saturday morning and I was here at the church and I was cleaning up, getting ready for Sunday. Hmm. <laughs> that tells you I was younger. This is 25 or 30 years ago. Spending my Saturday morning at the church, cleaning up, getting ready for Sunday. And uh, Raleigh York, some of you, almost none of you, was a few of you remember Raleigh Yarth. And Raleigh Yarth, these doors were open, and I saw him step into the hall. And uh, I went back to see what he wanted. He said, Max, you've got, to, so you've got to go see Jerry immediately. He wants to tell you something. I said, what's it all about? He said, I'm going to let Jerry tell you. Okay. So I got in my car immediately and drove over to the place where Jerry was, which is over toward... Hurst, because I, I know I always went through this back roads to get from here to Hurst, and that's the way I went to get to where he was. And uh, the minute I went in to see Jerry, he, uh, he rose up, sat up in bed, and he began to tell me about an experience he had had. And I'm going to read some of today's sermon out of this book that I've written. Um, and I had a lot of questions about whether to include this experience or not, because my part of it is so extremely personal. And uh, I didn't really know whether to put it out there or not, but then I decided the experience is too important to me not to include it. Anyway, Jerry said to me, I have seen hell. His voice was hushed and serious and tinged with fear. He hated to talk about it, he said. He brought it all back. But he had to tell me so that I could warn others. He said, I saw a wall of flames. I was hovering just outside this wall of flames for I don't know how long it seemed like forever. And the deepest voice I have ever heard was calling me from those flames. It was calling me into the fire. Now I write, I know enough about NDEs to know that the flames were imagery. Heaven's way of speaking to Jerry in a language he would understand. I mean, all of us expect hell to be a fiery place. But I also knew that there was a reality beyond that imagery and, and that reality was frightening. <laughs> I said a prayer with Jerry and thanked God for giving him another chance. <laughs> and I started walking back <laughs> to the car and I realized, Jerry had scared me. I mean, I had been pulled into his experience. And I found it very unsettling. I mean, just listening to his fear. And he told me I needed to go back and warn people. I got in my car started pulling out of the driveway, and for the first time in my life, certainly in my ministry, I decided, well, you know, I, I may preach too much about love. <clears throat> I might better include a little fire and brimstone in that. Now, this was my thought. It was my thought in my head. But that provoked something. The very next thought I had was remembering a line from the Apostles' Creed that we do not say in the Methodist Church, but I was Presbyterian for a few years. Don't tell anybody. Okay. I was Presbyterian for a few years, and they use a version of the Apostles' Creed that has this line in it. We say that he ascended into heaven before they say that in the Presbyterian church and in other churches. It has the line, I descended into hell. 
So I had my thought about perhaps putting the emphasis a little different. Then that line from the Apostles' Creed came to me. And the next thing that happened is an experience began to unfold over which I had absolutely no control. Um, and I was, <laughs> I was watching it happen. Immediately with these words from the Apostle Creed, one of the most extraordinary experiences of my life began to unfold. An image of Jesus, you know, God, God is very clever. God took those flames from Jerry's experience and put them into mine, okay? An image of Jesus intentionally, deliberately, descending into those flames filled my mind. I knew that this too was imagery, but at that moment it seemed to be happening right before my eyes. A great drama happening right in front of me. It was going on at that moment. Jesus, an image of Jesus. Now, I was driving, okay, but if you've ever had the experience where you're driving along and suddenly you take notice and you're miles down the road from the last time you looked at the road, we can drive with a kind of second sight. I was doing that. I was not aware of anything in the road. Fortunately, I was on a, that country road between Hearst and here, driving along, not, not much traffic, no traffic at all at that moment, although if a car passed me, I wouldn't have particularly noticed it. I only saw this image before me. I was watching, and it turned out this whole thing was entirely about me. Not about Jerry, but I want to apply this to everyone. It actually was about Jerry. It was about you. But in that moment, it was entirely about me. Two things were made absolutely clear to me, not in words, but in immediate awareness. One was the goodness, the perfection, the sinlessness of the one who was descending into those flames. I could, I could feel his goodness and his perfection and his purity and his grace. And I knew that this was the absolute and unquestionable way you know things in these mystical experiences. And the second thing <laughs> made absolutely clear to me with overwhelming power that he was entering those flames for me for my sins. Me, <laughs> the preacher, goody two-shoes. <laughs> he was entering those flames for my sins. But I can assure you, I write, there was no recrimination no judgment, no condemnation, just pure and gracious and unconditional love. Love for me beyond words, beyond reason, beyond any understanding. Here, the perfect Lord of creation who made me was descending into hell 
for me. And there it was happening right before my eyes. In images that must have been superimposed across the road, but I have no memory of seeing the road. And I was suddenly in tears. And I cried out to Jesus Christ. Not for me. Do not do this for me. Because in that moment, something I can't muster in ordinary life. I think I must have loved him as much as he loves me. And I said, I, I yelled it out loud there in the car. Do not do this for me. But it was done. It was a done deed. It was a done deal. And I realized something. Hell has no power. God has taken all of it upon himself. And as the Apostle Paul said, all of us have been redeemed. Some do not know it, and some do. Because God has forgiven every sin. Every sin that anyone has ever committed in the whole wide world. And God is entirely and completely victorious. That's the first thing I realized. The second thing I realized, now let me remind you, the thought that I should change my preaching, the quote from the Apostles' Creed, then the experience. And my question was answered, and God said, no, you are not these are not words I heard, but this is what the experience says to me. I was not to change my preaching at all. It was all about love. And love has already won the victory. You cannot stop it. There is no power in all of creation against God's grace in your life and in mine. But the reason I share this with you today is I've been thinking recently how carefully God monitors our lives. He knows our every thought. He knew the moment that I said those words and immediately God countered it. Now, I, I know this may sound a little egotistical that God may be this interested in my preaching. I mean, you know, I'm not in uh, I'm not in one of the world's great cathedrals. I'm not the pastor of a mega church. I don't have a huge TV ministry, but but that God is interested enough in my ministry to to say this to me to speak this experience to me, to show this to me. But the truth is, God is interested in everything that we do and everything that we go through, all of us, every one of us. And recently I have just been overwhelmed by the reality of that saying from our Lord. Not a sparrow falls without your father's knowledge. It does me good from time to time to know that everything I have done in my life, every mess I have made, 
every unkind thing I have ever thought. Now, it does bother me sometimes, and I think it'll bother you <laughs> to know that God knows everything that we are thinking. There's a person who had a near-death experience, and uh, one of the things that appeared in their near-death experience in the life review was when they were sitting behind somebody and the car pulled out rather slowly and they were angry and they honked several times. He said, yes, <laughs> even that is there. Everything that we have, every mistake we've ever made, every sin we've ever done is, com is forgiven now because God loves us that much. Now, during that experience, I was, I was fully aware of how much God loved me. Sitting here right now preaching to you, I feel it less even than I did then, although I, I do know it now. We don't feel it all the time. But that love is always, always there. Now, I have shared with you the strangest experience I have ever had in my life. In this book, when I first wrote the book, I left it out. Then I put it back in. And then I took it out again. And then I put it back in again. And it's going to stay in there. Because it speaks to me. Because generally we have failed to understand salvation. We have un failed to understand the depth of God's love and God's sacrifice for you and for me. And that sacrifice has worked. And you and I, as we are right now, are reconciled to God. And from God's side, there is nothing that stands between us and God. Join me in prayer. Gracious Lord, how we thank you for loving us and forgiving yourself for us. And forgive us now because we know that our sin is a pain that you have to bear. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for taking the cross. Amen. Now, there's an addendum, by the way. Uh, this experience that Jerry had fairly well scared the hell out of him. He became a very different person, much kinder. He reconciled with his children before he died two years later. And his wife told me that as he was dying, he said to her, look there, honey. You see them? They're over next to the door. There are two angels. And they're waiting for me. Amen.